everybody talks about this uh, when they get in the car. Um, and when I was growing up, seat belts did not, they're not what they were today. Today, kids get in the car, my daughter gets in the car, and it's an automatic thing with her. When we were coming up, when I was coming, I'm 50, when, when I was coming up, it was more of a conscious decision that you had to make. And then I think when my parents' generation was coming up and they just had lap belts, they sometimes didn't wear their seat belts, right? So as we have evolved um, in the world of motor vehicles, we have come to realize that seat belts make a difference. In fact, the numbers say that you're 70% less likely to be ejected from a vehicle and about 50% less likely to be seriously injured or killed if you have your seatbelt on. So the, the jury is back on that issue and it is completely clear that wearing a seatbelt is in your best interest. This video and the blog that accompanies this video is gonna talk specifically about what legal effect your case may suffer if you happen to not be wearing a seatbelt. So in Florida, as you know, the law is that if you're driving a vehicle, you have to be wearing a seatbelt. That violation of the law doesn't come into the court in a civil case, but what does come into court is the fact that you weren't wearing a seatbelt when you were injured. And the argument will be, just like I'm saying to you now, statistically speaking, depending on the kind of uh, wreck you're in, but statistically speaking and generally speaking, you're 45% less likely to get involved and have a serious injury if you're belted. And so if you end up with a serious injury and the other side, you're asking another side to pay for it, what are they going to say in response to that? They're not going to say, oh, here's a check, okay, and we're not going to argue anything about your seatbelt not being on. They're likely not going to do that. What they're going to do, because they're insurance companies, is they're going to look for any and all leverage against them having to pay more money. One of the things they can argue is that you were comparatively negligent for you yourself not wearing a seatbelt when a reasonable person would have done that. And if they can persuade a jury that you were negligent, it's, again, it's called comparative negligence in Florida. If you yourself is negligent for not wearing a seatbelt, i.e., an example, the reasonable person that was in your car at the time this happened would have put a belt on and you didn't, then the jury can say you're partially at fault or 90% or even 100% at fault for your own injuries. So. The practical effect of that is this. Let's say you are injured in a wreck and you go to court and let's say it's a really bad injury and the jury thinks that your damages are a million dollars, but they find you 50% comparatively negligent. We've talked about this in other videos on this channel, how comparative negligence works is, but after the jury leaves, the judge says, okay, well, the jury says you have a million dollars in damages but, and, and, then, and that the other driver's 50% responsible and you're 50% responsible. So therefore, Mr. Doe or Mrs. Doe, I am going to take off half of your verdict uh, that they gave you, and I'm only going to award you $500,000 because the jury said you were 50% responsible for your own injuries. That's how comparative negligence works in these cases. Now, since most cases don't go to court, you may be wondering, why are you talking about this? If the jury does that and, and most cases don't go to court, then why are we even talking about comparative negligence? Well. The way cases are valued by insurance companies prior to the lawsuit being filed is everybody is thinking about how a jury is going to react to this case and these facts. And if a jury is going to have the ability to assess comparative negligence against the injured party, then you have to consider that in discussing settlement prior to suit because otherwise you're sticking your head in a hole and you're covering up your ears if you can do that at the same time. So my point is that your lawyer, your injury lawyer should be considering with you all the defenses that will come up if the case goes to a lawsuit in the settlement phase. Because if you're not factoring in those defenses and how to counter those defenses when you're discussing settlement before you file a lawsuit, then you're not getting a realistic impression or number on what your case is worth. So. The moral of the story is wear your seatbelt, number one. Uh, number two is when it comes to a situation where you don't have your seatbelt on, some clients are saying, well, are there ways around this? Yes, there are. Uh, there are some wrecks where a seatbelt wouldn't have made a difference. Um, if you, even if you had had it on, it wouldn't have mattered, okay? Uh, those are generally really, really bad wrecks where the person probably wasn't gonna survive even if the seatbelt was on. Um, but 
there are situations where the seatbelt defense is of no consequence. So it's really smart for you as a layperson or your family as lay people, non-lawyers, to seek out a board-certified civil trial lawyer if you have these uh, comparative negligence issues that come up. Speeding is another one we've talked about, but for purposes of this particular blog, we're talking about how a seatbelt defense will affect the value of your case, and it does so via comparative negligence. If you or your family have questions about uh, the seatbelt defense or car wrecks in general, you can find us on the web at zarzerlaw.com or you can call us at 855-HIRE-JOE. Thank you.